Josh. Yes. Josh. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm shorter than he is. Let's see. I'll try to find that magic happy spot where it's not too bad in the back. So I'm here to talk about our gene expression and analysis portal. Um, I'm with the Institute for Genome Sciences at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. Um, at first, uh, one of the, we're connected with the uh, medical school, and one of the MD-PhDs who spends most of her time doing cochlear implants in children um, for hearing restoration, she also does research on hearing loss. And they had a lot of gene expression data um, that you know, was stuck in spreadsheets at first. And they wanted to find a way that was usable for biologists to map that to a more visual way of, of being able to see the results of their data. Um, it was difficult for them to use Excel to do that, and later learning rudimentary R. And eventually, the scale of the data that came out, you know, Excel won't even open these files anymore. They're, they're too large. Um, and there was no existing way to take uh, your gene, gene expression data that you had for marker genes and compare it across lots of different experiments. So that was uh, part of the initial challenge. Um, she asked us to see if we could create a web interface that biologists could access these data, upload their own, analyze it on the web, and then compare with other published data sets. Um, they also wanted to be able to view the same data set different ways. Sometimes the bar graphs are appropriate. Sometimes uh, using T-SNE plots is appropriate, PCA analysis, things like that. Um, and then show multiple data sets at the same time so that uh, if you found something interesting, you could see if that interesting thing also was correlated in other data sets. So this is uh, an initial way of doing that view. The one on the right is simpler. This is um, a model of uh, the, the cochlea of a mouse, um, which is just an SVG with uh, bulk uh, cell-separated data. In this case, the purple areas here. The purple areas are the hair cells. And in this case, for this one particular gene, PAL4F3, we can see that that gene in hair cells is much more expressed compared to the rest of the inner cochlea. So this is a hair cell marker gene. Um, then when we started moving into having single cell data, this is uh, about 1,000 separated cells. Um, we could see also um, the hair, uh, outer hair cells and inner cells, so hair cells um, are much more visualized. This got more powerful. This is the same view, but using red-blue colorization instead of just a linear gradient. Um, this was actually really fun because in the past, they were using this gene SOX2 as a marker gene for supporting cells. So for not, not for hair cells, but for supporting cells. And then whenever we actually map this dynamically to the anatomy, this is the, uh, the cochlea uh, from the apex to the base and the linear positions of the cells, um, it turns out that SOX2 is a poor marker gene because at the apex, it is in fact, this is the orange cells, it is expressed, but as you walk along the gradient, its expression fades out and eventually goes blue and becomes unexpressed. Um, so this turns out to, the, the visualization of laying them onto the actual anatomy showed them that that was a poor marker gene that they shouldn't have been using from the beginning. Um, <clears throat> so this is, um, we have this idea of a data set in a box where if once you're showing uh, one data set, the user can use the menus and toggle between uh, many different visualizations that they've set up for it. Um, this is PAL4F3 again. Uh, this is a T-SNE clustering. We can see that it's lit up in this cluster here. You can toggle that to be instead of T-SNE, but you can have cell-labeled T-SNE or things like violin plots. And these are all different visualizations of the same data set. Um, the overall interface looks like this um, on, on the web. When you search for one or more genes, you get a list of them of matching candidates. If you click one, you have annotation across common organisms, more details about the functional annotation, go term links, links to external resources, and then as many different data sets as you want to configure that you want to view at the same time. That side-by-side -side visualization is extremely useful, um, and we're, to our knowledge, we're the only tool that allows you to do this. This shows, if you search for the same gene, PAL4F3, across data sets from many different labs, these are all the same time point in a mouse, and it correlates the idea that this is a good hair cell marker, um, both uh, here and in here, and all these data sets, even cross organisms. So this one's from a zebrafish, um, and the hair cells, again, inside it are much more expressed than other ones. Uh, including uh, time data in the, the course of development. So being able to lay these across from each other is, is very useful. Um, users on the tool can build their own profiles. The gear has over 400 expression data sets. Um, and uh, you can search them out, 
create a named profile in this one. There's a here in conference called ARO. Um, add, the, add to them. And those are the ones you see on the front page. You can also upload your own data to it and keep it private. So it's common workflow is that people will upload their data to the gear, keep mar market private because it's not published yet, view their data in the context of other published data sets for validation, and then they toggle it public once publication happens. Um, that's, we, we like that. But you can share it with individual people also. So um, if you have lab mates or collaborators, you can share your private data sets with them. You can also get permalinks so that you can link directly and use the gear as your viewer for expression data in your publication. So if people follow the permalink, they go directly to your data set only and they can explore it. Um, we've also started adding uh, integration with Epiviz so that you can view things like ChipSeq and ATACSeq. Um, Gyram is actually talking about Epiviz next. So I just uh, gave a demo example here, but that can be one of your data sets in a box for context. And we recently added a single cell workbench. So you can start with raw, raw data from, from Cell Ranger or something else, and then it will guide you step by step through doing the common analysis tasks like PCA, TCN and UMAP for dimensionality reduction, clustering, marker gene identification. Um, you can view cross-cluster cross comparisons, and then you can compare genes across different clusters. In this case, I've selected the top gene in each cluster and then viewed those in different methods. So we try to allow as many different visualizations as we can in the analysis tool. And then for things like PCA and TSNE, if you've done that in an analysis, you can toggle that as the view you see on the front page when you compare with other data sets. So uh, we also added a basic comparison tool. So if you have a data set with different conditions and replicates, um, you can do like inner hair cells versus outer hair cells. Um, <clears throat> pick statistical tests, and it will give you the, the simple XY scatter, but highlight those, those genes which appear to be statistically significant. You can also, this is interactive, so all, almost all these plots are interactive, so you can draw a box around the cells of interest, or genes of interest, save those genes, and then push those back to the front page to look in other data sets. Um, hopefully I didn't go too fast, but uh, I tried to focus just on the visualization aspects of the gear. Um, Dr. Herzano is the, the PI who conceived the project, and then we have two developers, myself and Brian Gottfried, and the Epiviz portion of the team. Again, Jairam's talking next. Um, any questions? Hopefully that keeps us on track. Any questions? <laughs> uh, what kind of limitation do you have in uh, in this web portal? How many data sets you can upload, download? There's none currently. No. Uh, in the data set size, our largest is about, most, most of the data sets in the gear, there's over 400 right now. The typical data set is 20 to 30,000 genes on this axis and between 100 and a million cells on the other axis. So it scales extremely well. Uh, really quick question. Uh, just, I was having a look at Gear, and it does look really impressive. Um, is there a GitHub link? Uh, not yet. There's, uh, the only reason why is I'm, I'm really, really fast at open source, and I agreed that I wouldn't work on a project unless it was. Uh, and so I'm really excited about that. Uh, but I think we're having like, a security person go through and make sure there's no like, issues, because we really want data, people's data, if they mark it private, to be private. So once somebody's done with that aspect of it, then, then it will be open source. How can I hear when you do add the GitHub link? How can, what's that? Oh, if you follow the web, if you, on the front page of the website, there's a new section, and I put it there. Yeah. Thank you. So I think it is time for our next speaker. Please introduce yourself and go ahead. Hello. Yeah. yeah you can hear it. All right. Um, so I'm Jairam Kansala. I'm a graduate student at the, in the computer science department at the University of Maryland College Park. Uh, today I'm going to talk about proactive visualization and statistical analysis in, of genomic data in Epivis. Um, so before I actually talk about that, I'm going to quickly introduce what Epivis is. Um, this work is done in collaboration with Z, who, is a, who has since graduated, but he was a graduate student with the HCI, the Human Computer Interaction Lab at um, University of Maryland. So genome browsers uh, are one of the most popular used tools for visualization of genomic data. They use the linear organization um, of data across the screen, and most data sets are um, visualized as tracks. 
They also integrate information about genes or other annotations along the genome, um, and they are also visualized on um, the process. You can also quickly navigate to a gene, either by searching for the gene or uh, directly going to that um, location. Um, so a, a couple, four years ago, my advisor, Hector Corrado Bravo, um, so he and another graduate student at the time worked on this tool called Epivis, which is an interactive visualization for functional genomic data. Uh, in addition to track-based visualizations that you normally see, we also support, the EPIVIS also supports plot-based visualizations. Um, and so these are more, into, for example, if you have a gene expression data set across different tumor types or tissue types, uh, it's more intuitive to look at that data set as a heat map or a scatter plot rather than a track. Um, so brushing also links all visualizations across the workspace um, by location. Um, and then you can create these workspaces and share them, um, just like the link that I have at the bottom of the um, figure. Uh, we also integrated Epivis with Bioconnector. So Bioconnector is an open source community where people develop tools and soft, uh, statistical analysis packages for uh, um, analyzing genomic data. Um, so if you have a local data set that is not public yet, you can load that data set into um, your R session, and then you can use our package, Epivisor, to interactively visualize with Epivis. You can also perform a lot of statistical analysis using the package available in Bioconnector and visualize those results um, in Epivis. I'll probably speed up. Um, and so that way, so you can have statistically, statistically guided interactive visualization. So you can um, use um, the R package, for example, in this use case, you're looking at uh, methylation based by data across different tumors. Um, you can calculate the regions of highest variability across those different tumors, and you can guide the visualization using um, those regions from the highest to the lowest variability. Um, so, and then a couple of um, years later, um, we asked the Bioconnected community what are some of the issues that they have with interactive visualization. And the top two things that came up was time consuming. It's not time consuming just to create interactive visualizations, but also um, um, authoring uh, them based on some statistical um, analysis and also implementing them. Uh, another thing that came up was data size is an issue. Um, so the larger data sets, it's uh, not easier to handle them. Um, and then the total number of respondents for this were around 80, I think. Um, and so to help with the implementation or uh, to create easily um, visualization components, I worked on this project called APVS Web Components, and that's what Joshua was showing in the um, slide before, presentation before. Um, so these are drop-in components that you can um, integrate with any framework that works with HTML. Um, so on the image on the right, all you see is that's how the element looks on, on a HTML page, and then when the browser renders it, it converts itself into a scatter plot. Um, so the, the, each of these components can either be linked to like an R session or a web server, um, and then they are reusable and extensible. Another thing I worked on the data side of things was the file server. So a lot of genomic data repositories like ENCODE or Roadmap Epigenomics contain a lot of publicly available data sets as files. Um, so one thing uh, we wanted to do was um, you, can query, you can query those files directly without having to download them. Uh, in addition to querying, you can also define transformations over these files. So for example, if you have a data set that has a lot of samples, for example, in the colon tissue, you can say, uh, calculate the average RNA expression across all those samples. And so it's not, it's not pre-calculating them, it's calculating on the fly based on the uh, genomic range that you're interested in. And then you can use uh, APVS to interactively visualize all the results from the files directly. Um, we currently support big bits, big bigs, or any other index of file format that, that can be indexed with tabex. Um, I'm also presenting this work at BOSC uh, on Wednesday, um, if you're interested. So, uh, so I've shown uh, how we can statistically guide uh, visual analysis through Bioconnector. Um, something, and this works well with Tuki's uh, idea of using both exploratory and confirmatory analysis. Uh, and something we want, but this often requires having two different computation environments for doing um, your exploratory and then using an R session for doing a confirmatory analysis. Um, something we tried to do with this work was bring the confirmatory analysis to the exploratory so that um, once you start the, with the genome browser, exploratory uh, statistical analysis runs, starts running in the background, and then um, you can you see the results dynamically. Uh, this, is, this works well with use cases where the best practices are well understood. Um, and so one question was, what kind of statistical analysis can you run in the background? For example, if you have a data set that you're looking at differentially methylated regions across different tissues, you can say what percentage of these regions overlap. Or if you're looking at uh, gene expression across different tumors, what's the correlation of these uh, 
gene expression. I'm going to do a quick walkthrough of how the tool looks like. Um, so as with any genome process, you would start with the region of, with your gene of interest, and in this case, case I am choosing ESR1. I'm going to pause in between just to explain what's going on. Um, sorry. I'm going to choose ESR1 as my region of interest, and then um, once, so once you choose ESR1, uh, what happens is it triggers a request to the computation server that automatically runs a state of, um, set of analysis. Um, and then the, the results um, show up as a feed as shown in the right sidebar. Um, sorry, this video is, keeps. Um, and so once you. Once you, um, it's, it's, so once you choose the gene of interest, it starts running a set of analysis. And one of the first things we do is, or at least in this part, is we, we are calculating differential expression um, across different, right. we're calculating differential expression um, across different tissues um, within the set. And so one of the first results you see on this is uh, for a gene aka P12, um, and you see it's highly differential across uh, colon, normal, and tissue samples. And um, since our region of interest is ESR1, you can actually go and search through the feed for ESR1 and add those to the, to the workspace. Um, and then you can do similar. We are also adding like the top two um, correlation analysis for those two data sets. And, and then you can also look at, um, if, if, if you're looking, interested in a data set that is not shown on the result, you can also manually add those results to the workspace. Um, and then all charts on the workspace are automatically linked by um, genomic position. And the last slide shows you the signal for different methylation data sets. Um, so this works, the, the previous instance is running on AWS. That's one of our local data sets that we use. But if you want to run this on your own data set, um, all we, you need to do is, is a, it, it takes input as a JSON file that describes what the data sets are. Or um, if it's directly coming from files, it has to contain where the URL for the file is located and has to be publicly available. And then you spin, uh, you spin off um, the feed instance that takes a list of uh, statistical analysis um, that, is, um, that is implemented in Python. So each class is a statistical analysis um, method. And then you, you define what, the, what type of data sets it requires, and then you, com you compute them on the fly. And with that, uh, the links to the repository is on GitHub, um, and the AWS is run instance is running here. Uh, I want to acknowledge my advisor, Hector Corral Bravo, Kyle Chang, who was an uh, undergraduate student in the lab who helped with some of the coding, and Nicholas Elmquist from the Human Computer Interaction Lab, and Z, who was a graduate student there before. Um, and also BioVis for providing me the travel scholarship so I can be here in present yesterday. Thank you.